Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. When I paint a person, it begins with knowing how to draw the person because human anatomy is exceptional in the way that it has very strict standards. It's not like you're not allowed to paint any kind of a person that you want to. Viewers will detect inaccuracy in a painting or drawing of a person very quickly. We are just really hypersensitive to the very subtle curves and shapes and, and anatomy that, that makes up the look of a person. The first component to being able to draw or paint a person is having a built up memory bank of all of the shapes that make a person. So I don't want to intimidate you out of thinking that you're able by saying, well, it's just all of these different shapes and curves. Well, we all have a lot of information in our mind already. It's not like that's impossible. It's just knowing how to get the right information where it needs to be so that you can uh, use it when you're creating something. You've seen my video, uh, if you haven't, look at how to draw a person. I do a simple diagram explanation of how I memorize where all of the different muscle shapes are on the, on the front view of a person. With this, I'm, I'm gonna sketch out a person in a more complex position, not just standing straight. Let me show you the paints that I've got. You can see black, white, red, yellow, and brown. To sketch it out, I'm just using gray. It's this black that I already have on the canvas mixed with the white that you just saw. It's just black and white. I, I'm not using pure white because when I've done you know, such, such stark contrast on my sketches in the past, it, sometimes it just interferes with my, what I'm trying to see and as I'm developing the other colors. So this gray is a little darker. Hopefully that'll help me to be able to paint over it and ignore the gray areas as I'm further developing my picture. Now before I go further, look, this is the front view. It's just kind of a two-dimensional front view of a chest that I did in my How to Draw a Person video. So this is just very basic geometric shape and then I'll put some shoulders coming down right here like this. This is the second part of that shoulder. Okay, this comes down here. We have this round shape here and here and then we have the arm muscles come down right underneath that shoulder like so. And then the rest of the torso would come right here out from that armpit area. Then you'd have this slope upward that's the trapezoid muscles and then the neck comes down right in front of those and connects to this collarbone is what that would be and then there's these couple of tendons that go up right there and the head is probably just a little bit wider than the neck and you can fit one head before you get to the shoulder so this guy has really wide shoulders because I can fit more than one head right there. This is a combination of understanding the way perspective works and just being familiar with what a shape uh, what what these muscles look like at different angles. See, I've drawn people for years uh, just for fun. When I was a kid, I was always doing it. <laughs> you can ask my brothers about that. I was always drawing muscle men, you know, and and I was always drawing with a purpose, and that was to memorize, to understand, and to memorize what I was looking at. And so, I wasn't just drawing that one picture, but always drawing. Uh, drawing the individual shapes. I was saying, okay, this is that part, this is that part at a different angle. So now I, I'm i taking some knowledge away from every moment that I'm drawing rather than just drawing in order to duplicate a picture. I wanna put that muscle that slopes up like this, and then uh, I'm gonna put the neck coming forward off of the chest. So the neck, another, you know, another little piece of three-dimensional knowledge is that the neck comes forward off of the chest. You know, drawing it, the front view, you don't see it coming forward. But the neck, so whatever angle I have the torso, I'm gonna have the neck coming forward off of that. And then I'll put the head kind of maybe facing down this way, maybe like this. Yeah, I like that pretty good. We'll put it there. And then here is where I would have the Obliques is what they are. So the ribs come down in an angle like this, and they're kind of, kind of a, what do you call this when something's kind of staggered like scales? You know, you have a set here, then a set here, then they lock in each other like this. Uh, but again, you can you can look at a lot of pictures 
to learn that pattern as long as you know what you're looking at, as long as you know what you're memorizing. So I'm going to arch the top of this muscle, this quad muscle. I'm going to arch that and understand that that, if it was straight, it would be long enough to go all the way up to the bottom of the shoulder here. But it's not, it's coming straight at me. So I'm going to make this short and it's going to go right here and then it's going to have the knee on it right there. And then from that knee, I can put this calf muscle coming down where it comes across the knee. Those runners are always complaining about that hurting because you run and it gets all tight. I want him performing a varial flip. And so I'm going to put, I'm imagining this hip being a little lower than this one. So remember it's an upward angle. And so that puts this hip higher than this hip. So this is going to help me to do a good job of placement with this. Even though I don't see it, I know what I'm aiming these lines toward when I come down here. And I'm going to put this knee about this far because I want to remember that that knee, if it was bending from the hip, it would go up to the armpit. And then I'm going to bend it enough that it looks like he's kicking it backward because when you do this particular trick, you have to kick uh, the back of the board backwards to do a pop shove it while the front of the board gets flipped with your front foot. So while many things are done by knowledge, you never stop doing things by feel. The combination of those two things really I think is where the money is. Okay, this is flipping it, that's flipped it and sent it this way. So really the board would kind of be sideways like this on its way to be flipped over and spun around. So let's go, let's see. You know, you go that way, you flip it that way. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the board spinning. Let's put just a little bit of an angle so that it just has some interest to it. We'll put it this way. We'll put it getting a little further away by making it skinnier as it goes this way. Ooh, this is convenient. Look, this is what I'm thinking. See this shoulder hop pops out right there? I'm thinking you can barely see this bicep right there. And so then it really just leaves kind of a subtle curve and then the line between the pec muscle and the shoulder, you know, which would be right here, is just good, good for my mental reference. So I'm going to put that there. Shoulders are raised up. So put that there and then we put a bicep that's just showing a little bit. Okay, now you saw my colors. My red, yellow, brown, black, white. Regardless of the color, whether this guy is black, white, or Filipino, you know, it, it's always going to be a combination of these colors. And it's just a, a system of their relationship to each other to get it to look like skin and not plastic or like a, a dead person. So this is a, a common source of trouble, I think, is trying to get these colors to look natural. So let's make a highlight color. Now, if I uh, take that color and try to darken it with the shadow, watch, I'm just going to put black in it. And so I try to do a shadow on this and then let's say that it's a rounded surface and I'm doing a gradient. This color in the middle is so wrong for skin because it, it turns greener than what you want there to be between the light and the shadow paint. When you mix really different colors, like a dark and a light, it, it always bends toward a greenish, a greener color than what natural light would do if it were mixing. So the first thing I need to do is get rid of that effect. So just to prove that this is true, if I add red, I'm replacing that greenish result with a more red one. So manually coming into the mix and changing what they do when they blend together so that this looks like a skin tone gradient. Well, I also want a lot of color in my shadow because skin illuminates. Uh, it's translucent. The sun goes in it. There's all this blood in skin that makes a lot of red color uh, that's added to whatever the pigment of the skin is. And so shadows can have a lot of color in them. Now they can also be very gray. It'll look like skin as long as we get get the color in that transition right there. This is the key is that transition needs to have that red in it. And I'll get more into that in a little bit. But this is why I have the brown 
because brown makes, uh, I can't make a brown that is this brown. It'll be grayer if I use my red, yellow, and black. So I can use brown on shadows and it kind of shortcuts this whole process. I don't need to do this whole adding red to the transition because the brown won't make, brown mixed with this color won't make that greenish intermediate result. So I can use that as a shadow and then just add whatever other color. So if I want to have, you know, if I want to backlight this skin color, let's put more brown in here. So we can just pretend that I used this brown in the first place, even though it's grayer than what it would have been. But if I want to add more uh, backlighting to that, then I put it on the other side of it. I don't, I don't just paint over the whole shadow. I leave, I leave that color there, and then if I want a different color shadow here, or just a backlight so I can add black and white. So now I'm starting to get like a three-dimensional blob of paint right here because I've got two different light sources on each side. And I can do that with a person too. Now here's something that happens with skin. Now this is why that red stripe that I put in that blend, you know, with, with clouds, I do it to correct, correct the green. Same with skin. Anything I want to look like natural light, I use that red to correct the overly green color. But the blood beneath the surface, you know, you, you may have heard the term subsurface scattering. I like, I like that. It's a very descriptive term because the light scatters as it bounces off all of the blood beneath the skin. And so while the light on the surface stops at this line, let's pretend that this is light and shadow. This is a hard shadow from, let's say, the bill of his hat. Then the light doesn't stop so suddenly beneath the surface because it's a blurry line, it's scattering. So here's the effect that happens. This is why there's always more red in the transition between light and shadow. It's because of that subsurface scattering. So what I'm gonna do is make a much more orange color. So I'm gonna do red and yellow. And it's, it's gonna be more red. I'm trying to make just a brighter, much more vivid brown here and I'm gonna put it right on this shadow so this still can be a sharp line of a shadow but beneath the surface is the continuation of the light that's here only visible on the surface so here you continue to see that color bleeding into the shadow now this will make a lot more sense when it's actually on on this body, but I just want you to see the, the breakdown of the relationship of these colors so that as I'm moving quickly through all these three-dimensional shapes, you understand that this, this is my light and shadow relationship. I just want to say it with even more, you know. I love these kind of effects and I do tend to go too far sometimes with them, but I mean, it's just cool. It's cool when you're like, I'm doing it, I'm controlling that. Hey, listen, if you'd like to see this video all in real time, then you can download that at my site and support me in the process at the link below. I want you to know that I don't conceal any information. This has all the same information in it as the uh, full length version. We just try to keep things more straight to the point for our YouTube audience. So if you want to do that, then we'll make that video available. Okay, I'm looking at comments on the recently released, but not recently created, getting started with materials and paint. That was sitting in our collection of videos for a long time, and I was giving it away for free on my site, forgot to make it public on YouTube, and uh, I'm glad that it's getting some, some good comments on there. Right away, thanks, uh, Robert Kimball, for the very encouraging comment. He says, after I get the oil painting skills I'm yearning for, I'm considering doing some mural stuff myself. Go for it, dude, and thanks for the lessons. Buying was definitely worth it. Wow, thank you. I, I couldn't ask for a, a better advertisement for my videos that I sell than, than you saying that it was definitely worth it. So thank you for that shout out. Jeffrey Bird says, can you explain the base paint a little better? So a base, 
is. That's funny, the Home Depot looked at me like I was a crazy person. Now, I'm gonna get a can of paint from back here real quick. There are different types of bases. Every paint company puts their pigments in a base. So every can of paint starts with the base, and you can see that this is not white paint. This, you can, I can tip it only so much. This will be very transparent, like Elmer's glue would dry clear, you know. And so if I put this on something, it dries transparent while the pigment is still seen. And so you get very vivid colors. The deep base is for the most vivid and dark colors. And so there's a pastel base and maybe a white base. There's colored bases. Those red and the yellow that are the same brand, they come in a red and a yellow base. Real red, vivid yellow, bright yellow, I don't know, something like that. So the base is the can of paint before the pigment is added. You can ask any paint store uh, about the base that they put the pigment in. That base determines the sheen of the paint. If it's flat, satin, semi-gloss, it's all in the base before the colorant is added and you can see how full that is so you know it's that much of that paint base and then the pigment added to that goldie crane hey look i'm really sorry about the discrepancy <laughs> on the the comments yeah you're right it wasn't public then it was public you know i focus all my energy on the videos that i've published publicly so yeah there's old old comments i never was able to get to but hey thanks for taking the time to comment and help help those views go up too rella ingram says my mural turned out great and it was because of the tips i took from you thanks hey Thank you very much for that elaborate compliment. I appreciate that. Help Junkie One says, do you use uh, these paints on canvas also? Yes, that's what I'm using right here. And then goes on to say, uh, I heard that latex paint will peel off over time. It will uh, if it's put on like a, a smooth surface that it doesn't chemically bond to. You know, it peels out of the five gallon buckets really easy, but it won't peel off of a canvas. That's not gonna happen. It's actually not latex paint. The, this is all 100% acrylic paint. And I think that that is the more common thing now for, for wall paints. Uh, you can paint with them on canvas and they do great. They just have different, different additives. They handle differently. They shrink more. The texture is not the same. If you're really into your brush stroke texture, probably paint and tubes, you know, even though it's more expensive, might be better for texture. There's not as much pigment probably in a gallon of paint because it's it's got a lot of other additives and solids that are made to, to withstand scrubbing and weather and, and things like that. But as far as longevity, I'm convinced that they're every bit as good as the tubes. Mr. Positive says, which store do you shop at to pick up talent? <laughs> Edvin Norin Grip says, how can you have the strength to paint large murals on ceilings? I have much bigger arms than you, and I die when I try to paint ceiling. <laughs> that is funny to me, but I don't doubt that you have much bigger arms than me. You know, they're not the biggest thing that you've ever seen, but maybe it's just the light weight of them makes it easier to hold over my head. You know, there is a, a, a big difference between muscle that possesses endurance to perform for a long time versus explosive powerful muscle. And so if if you spend a lot of time painting ceilings that are over your head, then probably your shoulders like mine will develop a lot more endurance. But you know, unfortunately, muscle mass is just not in my DNA. Maybe it is. I can do push-ups on my head though. Tia Richardson brings up a really good point. I've only ever heard good things about Nova color acrylic paints. I actually have, you know, this color chart that they sent me and, and I meant to try them out, but you know, I just came from a background of contract painting. I spent a few years just re repainting houses, decks, walls, you know, before I ever embarked on this journey to become a professional muralist, like 12 years ago, you know. And just coming from that background, I was familiar with the paint stores and the kind of paints they had and chose my favorites from there. They are cheaper. That's, that's the real answer. It's just accessible and cheap and I don't have to wait for it to arrive in the mail. But one of these days, I gotta get to trying out those Nova paints. I really think there's something to those. I hear that they're uh, simpler in their makeup, just having having uh, just acrylic binder and pigment added so, so that you probably get better coverage, maybe longer open time. Yeah, who knows, maybe they're a lot better than what I use. But as far as durability, and uh, you know, performing well for the job, I, I really think that these paint store paints are is, as good as any. Not as good as any. I, just, I mean, I really think they're top. I really think they're top of the line. <laughs> That's why I use them. 
Where's Laska says, what do you think of Floatrol? Uh, Floatrol is a product made by a company called Flood and it's, it's a paint extender. It's like a paint extender. I've tried it out and it didn't seem to do much for me in the way of giving me more time to mix my colors. I, I do think it, when you're applying the paint, if you're looking for just a smoother, more level surface, I think it's most helpful for that rather than getting you more time to blend and mix the paint, which is probably more its original intent, is to just give you smoothness uh, on your surface, you know, when you're like cutting in door jams and things, getting smooth paint. So I, I don't know, I don't use it really ever in my paintings. Okay, now I'm looking at last week painting my my big uh, leviathan coming out of the coming out of the sea these fishermen running away and breathing fire and all that susan rudolph says i'm learning so much from you zillion thanks hey thank you for watching susan potato salad says how do you not get frustrated when painting i do get frustrated when painting <laughs> I, I just don't spend a long time filming myself when i'm frustrated i did this yesterday and it was a total flop. I put it, put it too far over to the right and I was mad because I got all done with it and then some of the proportions I didn't like and I decided to move the whole thing over and then the battery on the microphone died and the whole video I made was like really terrible audio quality. N not only that, but, but the picture wasn't coming out great. So I wasn't doing a good job with the video or the painting and thinking about multiple things. Can drive me crazy. So I have bad days too, for sure. Hey, thank you Aaron for the nice uh, comment. The way you explain color theory is the best. All right, cool, thanks. XYU says, I always learn something new and tell every artist I meet about your channel. Hey, all right, thanks. That's really nice. I appreciate that very much. Lanuko says, I don't paint, but these are very relaxing and interesting to watch. Hey, all right. Hayadar Al Nakashi says, I painted this painting on a wall in my house because your drawing is wonderful. Uh, hey, thank you very much for that nice compliment. And the painting that he is talking about is the stormy ocean scene. He put the link there. And so I'm, I'm very flattered by that. Hey, if you've been working on a painting and you want to show the community what you've been up to, a lot of you have been getting my videos and doing these amazing paintings. And that's a real thrill for me to see. And so we're going to get some of those up on the next video. So just make a post at Mural Joe and we'll, we'll see if we can find some of your work to put on the next video. It's been a pleasure. So we'll see you next time.